Rebecca Lavoie. Welcome to the Undisclosed Addendum. Today we're talking about Tales from the Thunderhog, episode 16. This is the final addendum of season five of Undisclosed. It's about Jeff Titus, who was convicted of the 1990 murders of Doug Estes and Jim Bennett 12 years after the double homicide in 2002. Titus is currently incarcerated in Michigan and has always maintained his innocence. If you haven't listened to the episode we're going to be talking about, pause this podcast, go back and listen, and then come back to listen to this conversation. We will still be here, and it will be worth it. Join me to talk about episode 16 is Jacinda Davis. She is the executive producer at Red Marble Media, which was behind the Killer in Question series on Jeff Titus on Investigation Discovery. Jacinda, welcome back to the addendum. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And also with me is Kevin Fitzpatrick, founder and executive producer at Red Marble Media. Hey, Kevin, welcome back. Hey, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. And of course, we've got Susan Simpson, one of the hosts of Undisclosed. She's also a lawyer and a super investigator and the lead on the Titus case. Hey, Susan. Hey, Rebecca. Now, Susan, I hear there's an update for us, something about the case file in this case. What's going on? Yes. So uh, there is a lot of audio in this case file, um, recordings made with witnesses and one from the crime scene itself that night. Um, Exciting things to have for a podcast. And I requested them from the Kalamazoo County Sheriff's Department. Oh, what, seven months ago now? Um, (laughs) And I found out last week, I got an update. Oh, guess what? We finally managed to convert some of that audio for you. Wow. Um, Yeah, that's not a coincidence. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. It's funny. I have, a, I have a tape to MP3 converter that I should send your way next time you... Oh, no. This is not even complicated this. stuff. This is not even... Yeah. I've been through the whole thing with them. I'm like, here's how you can do it. Here's how you can talk to you. Here's how you can do it for them. They're like, oh, we cannot figure it out. Yeah. They're feigning intense incompetence to avoid giving the audio for the podcast. And then yeah. when it ends, they manage to find two of the files, but the rest they can't convert yet for some reason. Well, can so. you maybe put that on the website so people could listen to them there? <laughs> I, when I get them, yeah, they, they, they'll be used whenever I get them. This entry or next. <laughs> um, All right. Which, you know, we'll see what's in there. All right. Well, I do want to get into a couple of characters that appeared in episode 16 of the podcast. These are these two guys, Troy Jones and Jack Badger. By the way, how like how many alternative suspects can there possibly be in this case? It's kind of crazy. <laughs> um, so how do the stories of these two guys line up? So they line up in broad strokes in the sense that they are the only two people who say that they were there at the crime scene when everyone else says they weren't, Um, which is, as we discussed in the episode, you know, concerning fact in itself. But another indication that we don't have the full story here is that the stories of Badger and Troy Jones themselves aren't fully in line. And a lot of the, I, I guess, sort of lower level details of it, like how they got to the game area that night or who they saw on the way there. Um, simply don't match up. Hmm. Remind the listeners the differences and the way that like the stories can't possibly both be true. It's some small stuff. Like, for instance, Troy Jones says that they were there at the crime scene for half an hour that night, while Badger's like, we were there for a second, and then we left. And then there's Troy's brother, Todd, who testified that he was at the crime scene. And we know at least one of the Jones boys was there at the crime scene that night, and presumably it's Todd. And... Badger says that in the way of the crime scene, they run into Todd and talk to him. Troy says he never saw Bad- uh, saw his brother Todd there, and he's actually seemed kind of skeptical that Todd was even there at all, which hmm. is strange. And Todd says he saw neither. Right. So did Todd just put himself in there, like in the, in the scene, like you sometimes do when you hear a story so often? Did he just like put himself there, or do you think he was actually there? <laughs> at this point, I have to assume Todd was there. We know mm-hmm. that f- for sure either Todd or Troy was there, and most indications are it was Todd. Todd says he was there. Todd testified he was there. And it does fit that he was there. Now, you both spoke to Todd, you and Jacinda, right? What did he talk to you guys about? We kind of surprised him when we showed up at his house. He's working. (laughs) As with everyone. (laughs) It was cold out. But he, you know, he he seemed to remember what happened. He He remembered, you know, getting the call and he and his dad going back to look for Ron and, and figuring out was what was happening. Um, and he did not remember seeing his brother there. Hmm. Yeah. And I know all families are different, but the thing that I just couldn't get over, it felt so strange, is that he told us that after this night, his family never discussed the event again. 
like on purpose, just, never discussed it or no, just never just came up? No, just never came up. <laughs> Nothing to say about it. Just never, that time that you and dad went out and saw two bodies in the woods, just never discussed it again, never heard anything about it more. Weird. Just, just it never came up again. Put it in the feelings box and stuffed it under the bed or something. Or according to him, there were no feelings to have about it. Like <laughs> he was like, we went out there and saw the two gentlemen, couldn't do anything. So that was that. Huh. What did you make of that, Jacinda? I think it's really, you know, like Susan said, every family is different. But to not talk about it or to not even, you know, like if he didn't see Troy that night, that whenever Troy ends up coming home to say, oh, my God, did you hear what happened? Or And also they're they're called to testify and give statements and and whatnot. So it, they had to have talked about it. It does seem like like given that the entire family was interviewed within a few days time period about whether any of them saw Troy and they're all like, nope, didn't see Troy. You at least go like, okay, why do the cops keep coming to us and asking if we saw Troy when we didn't see Troy? Hmm. Kevin, what do you make of these kind of like shifting stories? Who was there? Who wasn't there? And this idea that, you know, is it just because Jacinda and Susan approach them and they're just like clamming up? Like, what do you think is going on here? Do you have any idea? I, I still find that one of the most incredibly interesting and infuriating things about this story is that there are a so many suspects, right? But but b that I, I feel that so many people are lying, but I'm not sure what they're lying about. Right. right. So you can naturally take the fact that they're lying about oh maybe they're involved in a murder. Could also they could be lying about anything. And I know Jacinda and Susan both said that in the podcast in this episode, right? It's and they, there was something that was going on back there that they don't want anyone to know about. Mm. Doesn't mean that they're necessarily involved in the murder, but that happens time and time and time again in this story. I mean, it's almost mind boggling how many times it happens. I don't know what these guys were involved in, but something bizarre was going on that day that they don't want anyone to talk about. And they want to place themselves at the scene and nobody else seems to be able to place them there. Right. I don't think they want to place themselves there. I think Troy felt like he had to place himself there, given that Badger wouldn't stop talking about it. (laughs) You've been running your mouth. (laughs) Well, yeah, that, that may be. At some point, they needed to be able to say that they were there with other people. So it wouldn't seem odd, whether that's the Right. footprints or whatever you're going to get into later. There's some there's some something they're not saying. I don't know if it relates to the murder, but it's it's clear that it's not the whole truth. I mean, it's drug stuff if it's if it's not the murder. Right. That's that's what keeps coming up over and over again in this. And I'm not I want to make, make a, a, a like a broad accusation. I would suspect uh, my opinion would be given that everything else we know about so many of the other characters here. It seems like there's like secret weed fields everywhere in this community. There's all sorts of transactions going on. I mean, stuff that's illegal to the extent that which people would be prosecuted for it. Uh, but that also lands people in these like physical locations. You know what I mean? That is true. But also, I actually tend to think they really were out for deers that day. Oh, deers? <laughs> deers. <dirt. laughs> the thing about um, the story also, particularly Troy and his, his brother and his parents, is that his parents and his brother didn't feel compelled or didn't feel like they needed to lie for him. Right. Right. Troy is saying, I was there. I was there. Everyone else is saying, no, you weren't. No, you weren't. And there doesn't seem to have been a conversation or anything where Troy's like, well, can you say you saw me, you know, can you cover for me? (laughs) Or he did. And they're like, hell no. (laughs) Or he did. And they're like, no. Um, But that to me is weird too. Like how come no one's covering for Troy? Um, Weird. Yeah. All right. So there's a polygraph involved here, our favorite piece of technology. Um, The cold case team really seemed to like polygraph technology. Did they ever use polygraphs on the Troy and Badger issue, Susan? They contemplated it. Um, In fact, after they did their interviews and Troy and Badger are like, yeah, we were there. They're like, well, that's a problem. How about we have y'all come in for uh, polygraphs? And they set up Troy's first and Troy comes in that morning and they apparently, according to Troy, start the polygraph, start answering questions. And then suddenly the examiner's like, whoa, 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 we got to stop this. You're too hungover to continue. Hmm. <laughs> and that's when in the, the report that we have, it does say like it was discontinued because he was hungover. And then just then I talked to him. He's like, no, nah, I wasn't hungover. They just said I was. <laughs> wow. That's... But he did say he'd been out drinking late that night, as single men are wont to do. Hmm. But they, ne- but they never followed up with it, right? Like they, they did. Never said, Come back. Oh, they, oh did. they did. What happened when they followed up with it? They rescheduled it or, or what? What I remember, and Susan, correct me if I'm wrong, is that they did reschedule, but Troy didn't end up taking a polygraph. Hmm. So they did reschedule. Well, 
in the report we have, it says we're going to reschedule. There's no sign they ever did. What Troy told us is that um, they did reschedule it. They asked him not to drink night before. He showed up. <laughs> and we asked him if he took it. And his answer was, uh, Jacinda, you're, what was it? It was like, he was like, I did what they told me to do. Well, yeah. yeah. So I don't know what that means. And we also know that Badger, uh, they said they asked him to do it. He, he apparently said yes, but they never actually scheduled it. Weird. Yep. It seems like they only do polygraphs. Like it's very selective here, right? And and I've never heard before of somebody like being hungover being a, a factor that would, you know, great excuse. Like if you ever have to take a polygraph, just spend the night before drinking. <laughs> Go on a bender and be like, nope, can't do this polygraph. Sorry. <laughs> I it means oh. I was drunk yesterday. <laughs> Jack Black <laughs> says in the School of Rock. Kevin, what do you think? I'm wondering if I could have used that hungover excuse lots of times in my life now, but um. <laughs> No, I mean, I find it unusual that people find these guys to be potential suspects, and it's not clear if they were ever really polygraphed. It's not clear what questions were asked of them. It, it, there seems to be this thing where they almost they fell through the cracks. Um, they were shoved through the cracks. <laughs> they weren't overlooked. They were deliberately shoved out of the way. Well, that's and that becomes the question, right? Like, were they deliberately shoved out of the way because it didn't line up with the other theory? And and that seems to be a problem. I mean, at the very least, um, you would want to have these guys on the record for what they really said. You know, you'd want to have the polygraphs. You'd want to be able to know if they were cleared. It just it, it all seems an un, it seems unsettled. Right. To me. Right. Let's talk about these reports of the cars driving away from 46th Street. Uh, how was Jack Badger involved with that? I wish Badger had agreed to talk to us um, because he, what we know is from a coworker who wasn't named in the file, so we couldn't track him down, who says, like, not long after the murder, like two or three days after the murders, Badger comes into work and is like, uh, I was at the crime scene. I heard a shot, heard someone yell. I went over and saw two people standing over a body. And when they saw me, they ran up through a, like a field line to a car, jumped in and drove away. And I, I, it's a secondhand report. So we, you know, caveat supply, but I just wish I knew what Badger had been talking about because it does seem to fit several reports we have, or secondhand reports actually, of people who were also driving by that day, like down 46th Street, which is the road uh, that the Burnworths and Titus's farms are on. And they reported two people running into a car and speeding away. Hmm. So that does seem to line up with what Badger allegedly saw. And again, we got no first-hand accounts here to really compare it. I've talked to one person who should have been a first-hand account, but he can't recall it anymore either than a vague recollection of like the two, like, two people were into a car. So nothing really concrete there. Um, what's interesting is that if that's correct, both Badger's reports and the second-hand reports of the people they saw there, whoever it was wasn't parked in the parking area of X Avenue. They were parked like off the street, of, off 46, and would have run up like – on the side of Titus's field hmm. to get to the car. Could it have been him that was one of the people standing over the body and ran I'm, to the car and just told people he saw that to try to like divorce himself from that, uh, you know, that, that scene. That's why I wish he would have talked to us. <laughs> we could have clarified some things there. Yeah. 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 Was that you? That you- <laughs> <laughs> I, I probably would not have, uh, use that approach as yeah. some of the investigators did in this case. Yeah. Did you do it? Yeah. Did you kill them? <laughs> <laughs> So we got a question from a listener that I think is really interesting. Um, so <laughs> I'm sorry. It, 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 I thought for a second his Twitter handle was Don Johnson. But it's, not. <laughs> it's John Donson. Wow. <laughs> um, Don or John uh, says, at this point, are we certain that Estes and Bennett didn't shoot each other? The 50 caliber slug from the black powder rifle looks like a slug. Bennett lived long enough to shoot back. Others manipulated the bodies and shotgun. Was the black powder rifle loaded? That is a complicated question. It sounds like John Don um, knows something about guns here. And I'm I, Susan, what are your thoughts here? Um, muzzle loaders are convenient that you can tell for sure if they're fired or not so we know for a fact that bennett's gun had not been fired okay it was half cocked it was whatever the he had it set up so it was actually really easy to fire it and not yet been fired so we know his gun was not used um the uh so 
I guess kind of let's say that the theory of the prosecution of the cold case team is that the gun used in the murders is the gun of Doug Estes, which was a 12 gauge shotgun. Um, but there actually is no evidence that his his gun was used in the murders. Um, it can't be ruled out because it theoretically could have fired the shots like the, the kind of shots that they were found. But there is zero evidence that it actually that gun was, in fact, used. I think the reason they have this theory about Doug's Mossberg being used is that we know Titus's shotgun could not have been the murder weapon. Right. So for, for Titus to be the murderer, they would have to use a different shotgun. So they, you know, kind of shoehorn in Estes's shotgun. But there just really isn't any affirmative evidence that it was. His shotgun, too, was also fully loaded when they found it. So if it was used, someone had to reload it again. Right. So, no, his shotgun, it sounds like, well, it either was reloaded by the person who took it and returned it uh, or it wasn't used and someone just took it and returned it. Right. I mean, that, that's what's going on. Or the killer oh. took it from him and put it there. He just dropped it. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> really interesting. I don't know. Kevin, do you think about this gun thing as much as I do? I mean, the gun seems to sort of be like the linchpin of the case here. And yet, I mean, there's just nothing except for a theory. No, there's there's nothing except for a theory. And, and the gun seems to be the problem for everybody. It's certainly a problem for Jeff Titus. I mean, he did say to Jacinda when we were sort of first producing a show way back when, I wish I'd never found that gun. And I bet you he fucking believes that more every day. Right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just this, this concept that everybody has to explain the gun, right? So when, when, when we interviewed Mike Brown, cold case detective, you know, he had this theory that somebody, you know, that Titus took the gun home. He cleaned it. He brought it back. He put brand new shotgun shells in it that were different than the type that Doug Estes used. And there seems to be so much energy spent on this gun to tie together the theory that Jeff Titus could have done it. He found the gun. He did this. It is the sort of linchpin of so many different theories. And it's, it's really confusing. I mean, um, when you just start talking about like somebody from Athens found the gun and put it back and big Jack and like everything revolves around the gun. Yeah. And, and if, if the gun was just found next to the body, there'd probably be a lot fewer sort of grandiose theories about how everything could have transpired. So you just told Um, me that um, Mike Brown told you something that makes no sense to me. Okay. So Mike Brown mm -hmm. says that Titus took the gun, brought it home, cleaned it, and then put a different kind of shotgun shell in it and returned it. Right. So that makes no sense because if he cleaned it, then he knew it could potentially be the murder weapon. So why, why bother putting a different kind of shotgun shell in it? You know what I mean? Well, I don't think I don't think I don't think Mike Brown knew for certain that they were different kind of shotgun shells. Right. We don't know what kind that Doug was using that day. So how do you know it's different? Right. <laughs> well, right. But he was suggesting that they were different. Right. He was yeah. because they showed the shotgun shells to Estes's family and they're like, he doesn't hunt with that brand, whatever it was. But the brand was very, very common. I mean, it's not like he had something, some exotic sort of ammunition in his gun. And and but this was what this is what Mike Brown was using to suggest that somebody had put, you know, had staged the gun and returned it and put shot, new shotgun shells in it because they were different than it, than what he normally used. But I why mean, would they do that? I don't know, I don't know how you can so, prove that. I don't know how you can prove that. <laughs> There's a whole long story here, and it's really dumb, so we didn't include it in the season. <laughs> but the, one of the big pieces of evidence against Titus, according to the cold case team, is that there was a brand of ammunition called Active, a- A-C-T-I-V, no at the end, that was loaded in Doug's shotgun. Now, we don't know what kind of shotgun Doug used that day, so we have no way of really saying if it was or was not the kind of shotgun that uh, shotgun shell that Doug would have had. Right. But when they did a search on Titus's um, house, they went through his like his discard barrel. Like He, he would collect like shells that he found while hunting uh, for reloading later. Mm-hmm. And when they did that, they found his barrel full of like empty like old slugs for reloaded later. And I think three of them were active brand. Mm-hmm. So they're like, aha, he has active brand ammunition and therefore he reloaded the active shells into the shotgun. But the three active shells he had were one, used. They're collections like from the from the ground they found out there. And two, they were for they were they were bird shot. They weren't even buckshot. Like right. they were a totally different brand type of a active brand. So like there's zero reason whatsoever to ever connect those two things is like somehow being just dis- yeah. So Susan, there were only three shells that matched. I mean, I had. They didn't match. They were they, they were like goose goose rounds. They were they were birdshot. They were not buckshot. It so was it the was, brand. Yeah. Yeah. 
but it was a totally different kind of ammo. I always had the impression that they'd found like a box. Of- oh, no, no. They found three empty shells, three empty like for reloads for, just for. So it, it was. That's even more absurd. Yeah. So it's a different, slightly different kind of make. It has some like it's it's all plastic. So it's not tr- the same as some other brands. So Titus had three and he says that like he was curious if you could even reload them well. That's why he kept them. But like there's just no reason to even like concern yourself that like, oh, of course, Titus the murderer because he used a brand of ammunition of a different type that matched the gun. Anyway, so, it's a whole lot of nonsense. I, I will tell you, like any defense attorney worth his salt would like make a golf analogy, right? They'd be like, okay, so I play with Titleist balls and Kevin plays with Titleist balls. I'm dead. I went to Kevin's house and he had three Titleist balls in his golf bag, but they were a different model of, of Titleist ball than the one Rebecca uses. But it proves what? It proves nothing. <laughs> it proves nothing. Yep. He definitely seems to have had, you know, ineffective counsel throughout the yeah. process. But, but one of the one of the things that, that's extraordinary about this case and when Jacinda and I first started talking about it, it's just sort of I was just sort of dumbfounded by some of the things she would come into the office and say about the theories that people would come up with. So you want to interpret evidence in a certain way and you can create, you know, theories about virtually anything. I mean I'm sure if you tried hard enough you could, you know, prove that Jacinda or I was a suspect in a murder probably probably be easier <laughs> to prove that I was than she was but um but it there's you can you can interpret evidence any way you want and, yeah. and sometimes in this case I think people make extraordinary leaps in interpreting things yeah Jacinda did you have something you wanted to add here no I mean the whole thing with the gun too is I, you brought this up a few minutes ago Rebecca like why would anyone bring it back like that's that to me makes no sense like you know whether Titus found it took it home or badger or some random person like why would you bring it back yeah like especially if you felt like uh oh this is gonna look bad for me wouldn't you just throw it in a lake yes. in a river a hundred percent unless you want unless you thought it might be evidence that would help catch a killer unless you felt bad like maybe this will be found and help catch the killer and I, I shouldn't have taken it but like you're right wouldn't you call the police and say hey I did a really dumb thing well no you wouldn't no 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 let's <laughs> not go that far <laughs> I don't even think I would call the police and tell them I did that well I wouldn't have done it but uh yeah <laughs> I certainly would not take it back like yeah. that that makes no sense to me why someone would bring it back yeah I agree so here here's a strange story that I wish I had better documentation for but on the night of the murders, we know that they gave up on the search very quickly because it was dark, and they were convinced it was tossed into a the gun was tossed into a swamp anyway, so they weren't even looking that hard. But they had to stay to secure the crime scene overnight and did search in the morning. Well, about midnight, um, the other officers still there went to dinner, and they left uh, Deputy Harmson, the evidence tech there, by himself. Yeah. I interviewed him, and he was – he remembered it because he was so annoyed that he had been left there alone to do the whole crime scene while everyone else was going to get dinner. And while he was there, he saw two people drive up and start watching him. And the way he tells it, you know, he was all already crotchety and annoyed that he'd been left there alone. And I got some looky loose here doing their thing. So he – walks up and like confronts them as like you need to leave you're not getting past like getting in here this is the crime scene you need to go now and he tells me that it was jeff titus and apparently he's also told someone on the cold case team as well um i think workama mentioned it to you yeah, yeah but during our interview said that titus and stan came back well titus said it was richards that said this and it was not him it was mm. oh i think brown may have told me this too but um Anyway, according to Harmson, he he said it was Titus was there, and I asked him like, "Why do you think it was Titus?" He's like, "Oh, that that was the guy they convicted." I'm like, do you know what Titus looked like? He's like, "No." Did you ever like ch- c- try and compare or confirm it was Titus? Like, so he assumed it was Titus, but there's no evidence it was Titus. And I asked him to describe where it was, and he said they drove this road to the north. And when I talked to him, I was kind of confused because there's not a road there in the game area. Um, Except that when Jacinda and I went back there with Ron Elwell, the neighbor of the north, he took us back through his property. And in fact, there is an old like logging road there, right, where Harmson described. Uh, but if he saw two people come up there, then it absolutely could not have been Titus. Titus would never have been up there on that property. It wasn't his property at all. The road he's describing is the road that connects like the Joneses' property to the game area. The Joneses. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So if at that, according to him, two people from the, the direction of the Joneses' house, showed up that night and tried to do something, and he had to tell him to get the hell out. So, as in Todd and Troy Jones? 
we don't know who because he didn't he never wrote this down or tried to describe what we saw right right so it could have been like skinny pete and badger from breaking bad yeah. all we know um <laughs> but no that's interesting the coming back the coming back for some reason like what do you think that could mean I don't know. I mean, all I can think about is the story about s- someone trying to return a shotgun or something to the scene. Because why else would someone be there that late at night? It's like midnight. We're not talking like er- early on. There's there's activity and stuff to draw people over. Like this is just like one lone deputy left there to try and finish up, you know, marking locations for the for his diagrams. And th- then hmm. they try and show up when they think it's empty, basically. Hmm. Maybe they were just looky loos, right? Like they could have been, but they're also trespassing because they had to cut over. They're yeah. not going through like public land. They're they're cutting into the game area through the Joneses' land and the Elwells' land. I see. I see. You would have had to go onto their private property to even find or know that that road existed. Right. Right. Okay. Um, the plot thickens. Big Jack, uh, we meet him again in this episode. Um, Jacinda, remind me why Big Jack is important, and then we'll get into what we learned this week. Sure. So Big Jack. So way at the very beginning when I first started talking to Jeff Titus, he kept bringing up this story about Big Jack. Big Jack was a co-worker of Titus's, and they were friends, and they would hunt together. And um, Big Jack and his daughter would hunt on Titus's property. And um, Titus always said that Big Jack told him that the only reason he found the gun was because someone took it and then brought it back. And that's why he found it. Um, And I remember like every time, every time Jeff brought up this story about Big Jack and someone taking the gun, I would feel myself being like, Jeff, like, please stop talking about this. <laughs> like, it just sounded so ridiculous and so unbelievable to me. Like, I, I would actually, like, just discard it. I, I put no value into this story at all. Um, and then even Stan brought it up during our interview. And I remember having the same reaction, which, you know, isn't good. I should have really listened more. But again, you know, Stan was like, and then Big Jack. And I was like, oh, I wish everyone would just stop talking about this story because it just doesn't make sense. Um, but actually, maybe it does. Yeah. So let's get into the origins of the Big Jack story. Susan, uh, that story is, again, about the returning of the gun. And it's sort of something that, like, he denies having said, right? He does. And Jeff is very specific. Very Like, he says it was uh, he was working, like, the third shift that night and he went down to the power plant like you know during his coffee or lunch break and was apparently bragging again about finding the gun and he what he remembers and he's always says it the same way is that big Jack told him like the only reason he found that gun is because someone else brought it back and that's why i was there for you to find in the first place so right. like in other words stop bragging about it big jack says it didn't happen um i do think it's at least theoretically possible that, that this is all misunderstanding because when you ask big jack to talk about how the gun what he thinks happened he does say the big jack story as a theory but he when we spoke to him a bit about jack badger we you know we're really starting to think like okay this makes a lot of sense that jack badger or someone who knew him told uh big jack about this and that's how he told jeff about it he fully denies that happened mm. um and i i am torn on this one because in many ways, I think Big Jack's a very credible witness, and Kelly's daughter especially has a good recollection. But one thing I do think is odd, and it's, it, I kind of don't notice it more when I'm going back through our interviews for like the podcast and trying to pull clips and whatnot, because every time we talked to Big Jack and asked him about this, he would tell a story about how he got the call from the cold case team, and they came to him and said, we want to talk to you about this case. And like how how you found the gun. Now the statute of limitations would have expired on the gun thing, so don't worry about that. And Big Jack told us he's like, I ain't the smartest man, but I'm smarter than that. There's no statute of limitations on murder, so they can't waive anything there. And I'm like, why? What liability are you concerned about here? Right. Um, it seems like he really did have this feeling that he was. I mean, he went and tried to get an attorney. His daughter too. Uh, the daughter was accused. Kelly was accused of like actually being the one to take the gun back. And they were both told that Jeff accused them of putting the gun there, which never happened. They, right. The cold case team was either lying or misunderstood. But um, 
I do wonder if their fear here is playing, or at least for Big Jack, is playing into why he denies having any knowledge of this whole stuff, because he did, at the time, feel a real concern for his own legal safety. Right. Yeah, Jacinda, do you think this could just be like he's trying to edit himself out of the story a little bit? Maybe. I mean, I do feel like he's a little bit cautious about what he says. Um, he's adamant he did not tell Jeff that. And Jeff is adamant that he did. Um, and like Susan, I think I think there's some, you know, the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Jack does admit to this theory. Yeah, I think someone probably took the gun and brought it back. But I never told Jeff who or or I never told Jeff that. But yet it's still his theory. Um, so maybe, maybe he, maybe he knows who did it and just wants to be left out of it and protect that person or just, you know, doesn't want to get involved. What gets me too, is he insists that he, after Jack Badger Sr. died, that there was no contact between Big Jack Warren and Jack Jr. And yet he knew quite a lot about what Jack Jr. got up to after his dad's death. Um, it could have been secondhand information, but he knew like like bar fights he'd gotten into. He knew about like a car that he'd wrecked. He knew what he was doing. Like he had, it wasn't as if they, it, when we start talking, they try they try to make it sound as if they just didn't know about Jack Jr. at all. But Big Jack Warren clearly had some source of info about Jack Jr.'s life that was still still feeding him information about Jack Jr. Um, which to me suggests that maybe like there was something about this gun or the case that came to him. What do you think, Kevin? I'm curious as to your thoughts about this whole, like, Big Jack, uh, you know, putting himself in and out of the story. And then also, you know, Jeff is certain that <laughs> this is what he told him. I, I just, I find it a little weird. Yeah, I, I you know, it, it all feels the same to me as, as some of the other people involved. Like, there's something going on there that he doesn't want people to know about. But is it involved with the murder? I, I certainly feel like he's more just trying to edit himself out of the story. I don't know right. what he actually knows. And if he does, if he does know um, who did it and and he must have a pretty good reason for not speaking up, because I've never met Big Jack, but I find it hard to believe that he'd leave Jeff in prison for 20 years. Mm. But um, but I I think that he's definitely trying to to take himself out of the story. And um, I can very easily see a, a scenario by which Jeff is rambling on about finding the gun and how great he is and big Jack just going, Jesus Christ, he only found it because somebody brought it back for Christ's sake. Right. Like, I can right. see that scenario can, in my head very, because somebody very, put it there. very, yeah, yeah, very yeah. clearly. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's almost just like a shut the fuck up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to figure out the facts in these, in these situations because you're reading into the personalities too. Right. And, and um, I just, I, I don't know. I can, I, it's always trying to figure out, when you're trying to figure out the truth, you're trying to figure out, well, who's telling me this and what, what are they trying to keep me from knowing? So it's, it's, um, such a, it's such a perplexing case because every character feels like they have something legitimately something to hide. And, um, it's just trying to figure out what that is. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, so but I think Big he's Jack, trying to edit himself out. I think you're right. Yeah. Big Jack also, uh, told us when we first spoke to him that, Someone he knew had told him that Jeff Titus is innocent. They got the wrong man. And he wouldn't tell us who the person was that told him this. He, and the person's dead now. So he was still, he was just trying to protect their memory, I guess. I don't know. We talked to Kelly, his daughter, and Kelly told us right away. She's like, oh, yeah, that was Harold Irish who told him that. And we gave that info to, to Jeff's defense investigator, um, Swabash. And he didn't follow up on it. I, there's nothing in the records to show that Swabash actually got that info. But then again, I don't doubt it for a second that he just didn't care and didn't write it down. Right. But that's interesting to me because what Big Jack Warren recalls is that Harold Irish felt certain that he knew that Jeff was innocent. Well, he was also at the power plant and also from people I've spoken to was also someone who was friends with Jack Badger Sr. Hmm. And I've wondered if he could have been the conduit for info there. Yeah, that's that's sort of the crux of it. But first, a quick side note. How big is Big Jack exactly? <laughs> the name fits. Is he big? 
He's a big guy. Okay. Yeah. Just want, I was wondering if it was just like meant like Big Jack, like older Jack, or Big Jack, like actually Big Jack. It's always been something I've been curious about. And this is the <laughs> last chance I have to ask you, so I just did. Okay, let's put that aside. So let's talk about this VA connection, because that was sort of the revelation in the podcast. Um, Susan, can you just summarize that revelation and like let's talk about what it means or could mean? Okay. Yeah. So – I think we actually, despite the fact we have tons and tons of files about the VA interviews, I think there's a lot we don't know about the VA still and what was being said there. Because in the cold case team's notes, there's like hints about they got some more different stories and they didn't record it. For instance, they apparently got a ton of information about a guy named Don Broker who worked at the VA. And he apparently was saying some concerning, confusing things at the VA, and people at the VA told them that he had tons of information on the case. They don't record anything about what he's saying, though, of course. And the interview with him, they're like, we talked to Broker, and he was clearly lying to us and denied he knew anything, whatever, moving on. Well, Broker was married to Brent Birch's sister. So is it possible that stories about Brent Birch were also circulating around the VA through Broker? Like, I think so, because we know he was talking a ton about the case. Um I just think that the idea that everything was about Jeff Titus is what we kind of assume now, when in reality, I think it was just tons of rumors everywhere about all kinds of things. And I think that likely could have included rumors about Jack Badger Jr., whose dad was well regarded at the VA, it was the power plant VA. And I think it's possible that their colleagues were talking about Jack Jr. or things they'd heard about him. Um, and that's what ultimately Jeff heard, either either through Big Jack Warren or otherwise, right. and then repeated on. And yeah. we know Jack Badger was talking a lot about the case because he could not, as Troy Jones is very annoyed by, uh, could not keep his mouth shut about it. Really? Um, it's interesting, Kevin. I, I just keep thinking about what you just said about, you know, it could have just been an offhand comment that it was turned into something big. But this is also something that happens like when a murder or a crime happens in a small community, everyone thinks they know a piece yeah. of it. It's amazing yeah. to me that though that the rumors, the gossip, the whatever, some of it could float up and actually be thought to be true. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of, one of the things that I, I've really thought about this story for a long time and, and, and certainly since, you know, we met Susan and, and she started talking to us about some of the stuff she'd been finding is that the only way you were ever going to get the truth about, about what happened that day is if you literally got everyone in one room at the same time and made them tell their stories in front of everyone else, because they all seem to be telling the stories. Like everyone talks about Jeff is boasting half the other people seem to be boasting too. And, and it seems to be like, you know, an old sewing circle for Christ's sakes. Like everybody wants to tell this interesting part of the story and make everyone think they're cool. Or it then turns into a game of telephone where they only got part of the information from another person or they're trying to make this person look bad or this person look good. Or I wasn't there. I was there. And it just felt for a long time. Like the only way you'd ever get the truth is if you got everybody into one room and made them tell what they know in front of each other. Mm, kind of like a and trial. It's, yeah, exactly. That's basically what a trial is supposed to be, except it never happened. That and way, they didn't right? call the ones they needed to, yeah. That's not like a trial. Yeah. That's like the Jack McCoy trick at the end of the Law & Order episode where he gets everyone in the room. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, because like even at a trial, like you know, we all know people lie on the stand all the time, and people can't often see you testify. And it's, you know, they can get the transcript or whatever. But if you just tell the story in front of someone, and they're sitting right there, and it's not just the person who, in this case, it's not just the person who's accused of murder. It might be the other person who's dealing drugs at the same time who you double cross in a situation, or it might be the person who's, you know, you're having an affair with their spouse or whatever it is. There's like this, this story is just overrun with people having their own agenda to tell a piece of it. Mm. And, and, and that, so it becomes problematic to find out what the truth is then, because people are telling you, information to keep you in the dark about something else and they don't they might not even care about this they just want to keep you in the dark about something else right jacinda what was your part in this crime i'm just kidding <laughs> yeah what was your part in this? did you do it i'll never tell did you move the gun <laughs> i bet jacinda worked at the va and just hasn't told us yet um so let's talk about kelly remind me who kelly is and how she fits into this Big Jack Warren's daughter. Yes. So she says she heard that Jack Badger had known one of the victims in this case. Did he? Yeah. Well, it. it we, I, 
Depends <laughs> how you mean no. Depends Jack what Badger no himself did, confirmed. Yeah. He did confirm to the cold case team that he had seen and run into Jim Bennett in the bars. He denied knowing him, but in context, it sounds to me like, yeah, he knew him. Uh, he maybe didn't know his name possibly or didn't know him well, but like he acknowledges he had run into Bennett in the bars and recognized him from that. So he knew him to, th- to that extent. Um, one piece of evidence we found in this case that I still don't have really an explanation for is that uh, we got the phone records for Jim Bennett. Again, they're like incomplete. They only show like long distance and they show outgoing only. So they're not, they don't show everything, but they do show a call about a week before his death that I've wondered a lot about um, because he called Kathy Swinehart, who was the friend of Tina, uh, the guy, the girl who's named Jeff Badger at the time. And Kathy was she's clearly very uncomfortable talking about the case will not give us information um told me that she didn't want to talk to me about it because she believed the guy in prison's guilty um but she did tell me when i tried to talk to her again about this that she was not friends with jim bennett she never talked to him on the phone there's no reason for jim bennett to ever have called her and i asked her well if someone from if jim bennett's line called you around this time period would that's just someone that you knew had been in his house and called you from there? Hmm. And she said that's the only, like, only way it could have happened because hmm. Jim Bennett would not have called her. And from what I know, that's true. They're, they're, they were not friends. There's no valid reason. And given there's not really any other connections between her and Bennett, I, yeah, I do wonder, was Badger or someone else at Bennett's house that week and called his friend Kathy? Um, we just don't have an answer there. Hmm. That's weird. <laughs> it is weird. It's super weird. It's super. It's extremely strange because she and I believe her about this. She says like he would never have called me, so the only way it could have happened is some one of her friends was at Bennett's house, and right. she denies having any friends that knew Bennett really. Right. Right. So talking about the detectives and prosecutors and sort of what they knew or didn't know about Badger and Troy. They knew this was a problem. They knew that. Something had happened. I think they probably suspected very strongly that Troy Jones and Jack Badger had touched Bennett's wallet contents, which is why they either canceled or somehow just didn't have the latent print comparison go through. <gasps> okay. I have a theory. Okay. Could it be? I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. Let's hear I mean, it. I'm excited. Do you think that Badger and Troy may have showed up at the crime scene later to return some wallet contents? Like to scat, you know what I mean? To like, if they touch the wallet, kind of, if they took something from the wallet, that maybe that's what, that's why they returned. To, to... They would have had to come back. They could have done it when they came back with Bobby. If yeah. That's who, who it was. Yeah. If they got there before the police. I, I always thought that it, it might not even be the gun. If somebody was going back, I thought they were going back to get something that was going to show who it was. Huh. Right. Like they had dropped something, or there was that theory that. I don't know if it was a theory outside of mine that there was a hunting blind somewhere and, and they may have, maybe if they didn't commit the murder, they, they, they saw who had committed the murder and there was something in that blind that could identify them as. There was a blind and they found cigarettes in it, but they never tested them. So who knows what they were. Damn. Of course they never tested them. I was always wondering if there was something else left behind at the scene and that's why somebody had to go back because I, I still don't understand the return the, fu- the fucking gun thing because like, you'll never make me understand that I, cause I don't really think much. it happened but, I just don't think yeah. it happened I think that the killer took the either either disarmed him before shooting him or shot him grabbed the you know maybe I don't know just I think that I think the killer moved the gun that's what I think happened yeah they could have moved it they could have realized they had it in the whole heat of everything and then dropped it or whatever but um yeah I always thought that they could have gone back but Anyway, I I took us off Susan's point of they thought they were a problem. Right. One other thing, yeah. the killer could have encountered Estes where where the gun was found and told him to put down the gun and kind of walked him to the place where he then shot him and then they ran into uh, Bennett there. I mean, that's another they could way it could have, have but it's just such it, it's a pretty long walk and yeah. like I don't know, nothing. Ab- there's something. It's it's a strange setup. Whatever happened there, but I don't feel very confident about any of the theories that we have so far. Um, I I suspect the gun, I think the gun was moved after they were killed. I don't think it was necessarily brought back. I think possibly someone grabbed it and then realized I shouldn't leave with it or they didn't want to leave, be seen leaving with two guns. Mm. And of course, then there's the wild card theory, which, you know, it's probably way out there, but they never actually tested, like checked the serial number. So we don't actually know 100% that that's the gun that Estes had that day. Hmm. Hmm. 
which is beyond reason. Yeah, like we should just we, we could still test it now. Like I just just for my peace of mind, we please just make sure this is actually Douglas's gun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like the, the, that that's always been amazing to me too is that there's just this big like swirling. Their assumptions are made based on nothing, and it probably is. But like, no one back in 1990 ever confirmed that. He showed it to Bob. Yeah, but they showed it like 12 years later. Yeah, and his some of his memories were like kind of wrong, but what he recalled about it. Yeah. Mm. The biggest, like, mind-blown moment for me during this whole, you know, working on the dock and, and helping out Susan was when we had that realization that, oh, my God, maybe Bobby wasn't the first one to find the bodies. Like, that was an assumption everyone was going by. Um, and that is a huge, huge um, idea that Bobby isn't the first one to have found them, whether it was Troy or Badger or or someone else or... But it's very possible there were multiple people, the killer, then someone else stumbled upon the bodies. But there is about 30 minutes before the bodies are found. Anyone could have gone and found them, robbed Jim's body, looked through his wallet, whatever. It almost seems more likely someone did come by than they didn't, given how crowded it was that day. Hmm. And it was just it was just something that no one had considered. I don't think anyone had considered anyway. No, but even though, like, again, in hindsight, it seems obvious. It just didn't register until you hear about <laughs> Jack Badger and Troy Jones. Man, I just I just think about just like the cold heartedness of coming across two dead people and just not being completely freaked out, like having the presence of mind <laughs> to search their pockets. Like <laughs> that's that's some cold ass stuff there. Uh, <laughs> There's actually a Canadian case, I think nineteen like fifty six or something around that time period. Uh, possible wrongful conviction case. It was never it's not really clear what happened but there was uh, three american hunters hunting i think bears in canada and someone was convicted and executed because he had some of the possessions of the three dead hunters and they used that as proof that he killed them and robbed them and he said no i did find them but i just took some of their stuff yeah and there, it from the facts that we had like it kind of looks like that could be true like it does seem like there are some other suspects that were never really investigated and it kind of makes sense what he's saying but then again he's got the dead guys dead people's stuff so let's go ahead and execute him right right the other thing is if if you recognize jim bennett as like oh you know he's, he's a drug, drug dealer oh he might have cash in his pocket yeah yeah and some of the cash is gone like they, someone took the cash like like hmm. cash went somewhere so hmm. Well, I have a final question that I want to ask all three of you. We first talked weeks and weeks and weeks ago about your feelings about this case, and they were kind of mixed. And now some time has passed and some other things have been uncovered. And I, I just love kind of your impressions. Has anything changed for you? Do you? How do you feel any differently about Jeff Titus's guilt or innocence? Or, you know, what were the, was there something that has changed for you when you're just kind, of, just kind of reflecting on the case, the investigation in this story? I'm going to start with you, Kevin. Well, I, you know, I think I went into the story. Well, I know I went into the story at the beginning with an open mind. Jacinda and I were making a series where we were going to do cases where we're, we we're basically asking the audience to decide. We were going to present both both sides of it, and we weren't going to come to conclusions in any way. Um, sort of after doing that story, well, while well, producing it, but we sort of kept open both sides. It became clear to me that I didn't think that at first I didn't think there was just enough evidence to convict Jeff. I thought that there was certainly reasonable doubt that um, he, he shouldn't have been convicted on the evidence that was there. Now I just don't really see a way that I, I just don't think that he could have done it. Hmm. And, um, and even if I were to just say, okay, well, it's based on reasonable doubt or whatever. There's so much, there's so much reasonable doubt. There are so many other suspects. And I don't think that there's ever going to be, I hope I'm wrong. And if anyone can figure it out, it's Susan and Jacinda, but, I don't think anyone's going to have a clear understanding of what actually happened that day unless someone comes forward like a deathbed confession and says, I did it, or this is me. Mm. I, I just, I've never seen a case. And this has become more sort of entrenched for me as we've been doing it. With what I would call a more perfect storm mm. for everything, right? Like Jeff's it's on Jeff's property. It's kind of like wrong place, wrong time for him. He finds the gun. Um, you know, I'm not convinced that that there's the greatest investigation that goes on at the very start, either through manpower or whatever. 
but a lot of sort of loose ends are left are left hanging out to dry. And then you've got a scenario which you've got a cold case team um, and they've got a lot riding on the conviction. Mm -hmm. And like every time you turn around, it just seems to be a perfect storm Hmm. for Jeff. Yeah. And, and then Jeff, Jeff being Jeff is part of the perfect storm. I mean, I don't think that if I were in that situation that I'd be sitting in jail 20 years later, I think that the fact that he's just not likable um, to many people or off-putting is, is part of this sort of perfect storm as well. So I, I don't know that anything's changed in my mind. I, I guess what, what amazes me is, is um, every time I talk to Susan and Jacinda about it, it's like, Jesus Christ, another crazy thing. Yeah. Like you, it's almost <laughs> like, you know, we all say this in the pandemic all the time. Like, you know, that something bad's going to happen every day or something. But every time I talk to them, I know there's going to be like another suspect or another thing that somebody didn't follow up with. Or and you're just like, mother of God, again. So I, I guess I just continue to be amazed. and. Um, and I, I hope that Jeff, um, I hope that he gets out. I hope that, uh, I know that the pandemic is sort of hindering, you know, everybody in prison. Right. And I just, I hope, I, I hope that, that at some point somebody just says, there's no way we can know what happened that day right. and we can't keep a man in prison because of that. Right. Well, Kevin, it's been a pleasure talking to you this season about this case. I'm so glad you're able to join us so many of these weeks. And I'm so glad that uh, people are still confused about whether or not you and I are married. Um, (laughs) Finally, we're not. Again, uh, I actually, somebody else asked me that, like if if you were, if Kevin, my Kevin had been on. And I was like, no, it's a different Kevin. Anyway. I'm still mad I asked you that. (laughs) (laughs) So, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure to get to know you. Well, thank you so much for having for having me. I've I've really enjoyed it. This story has become um, something really compelling for me. Jacinda, do you have any final thoughts on the Titus case? Has anything moved for you? Yeah, I mean, like Kevin, I went in with an open mind and and tried to look at both sides and and treat both sides with the same, um, you know, respect and and. And now I'm clearly, I, I just don't think Jeff did it. I, I don't think there's any evidence that, that shows that he did it. I believe that he was miles and miles away. Um, and my hope is that, you know, I think I think some of these questions could be answered. Like Susan was saying, there are fingerprints on some of the contents of Jim's wallet that haven't been tested. Those could be tested. Um, I think, you know, if someone could subpoena uh Badger and Troy and find out what they were really doing back there. Um, I'm not saying they did it, but maybe they saw something or or even if they were the first ones to find the bodies and, and move the gun, like all of that can help Jeff's fight for exoneration. Um, and I think he deserves to have that consideration. So, and it, it's a hard story to let go of. I don't think I'll ever let go of it until there, you know, is a conclusion. And I don't know whether that'll be in three months or a year or, or when. But um, I, I do feel certain that Jeff is not guilty. Wow. Well, Jacinda, um, your insights into this case have been so interesting, and it's been so great hearing Susan have such a great investigative companion out there in the field. Uh, thank you so much for joining me week after week to talk about the Titus case. You're welcome. I'm going to miss you, Rebecca. I'm going to miss you, too. <laughs> Susan Simpson, uh, final thoughts? This this case is obviously an interesting one with some pretty crazy twists and turns. And I think all that goes back to a decision made by the higher-ups in the Kalamazoo County Sheriff's Department back in 1990 when they decided, for administrative reasons, that they were going to put Detective Bruce Rosima and Rosima alone on this case. And I think that set the stage for everything that happened thereafter because one detective alone even later on when he got help from Roy Ballot could not do what needed to be done when this was all still possible to solve right. and because of that there were all these basic facts that just they just physically did not have the time or ability to track down that left all these questions um, unresolved and some basic key issues never pinned down and that brings us where we are 30 years later with <laughs> just all kinds of crazy stuff going on. Um, for me, I, I do feel at this point that I think Jim Bennett was the target in the case. Mm. I do think that is what 
somehow, some way led to the deaths of both him and Doug Estes. Um, I don't particularly think that Troy Jones and Jack Badger were involved in the murder. Um, nothing we found really fit well with that idea. I do think they know something pretty important about this case, and I hope that maybe one day they they will talk about it. Um, I do have a fear that it may be too late to solve the case. Right. Um, that the people that I most want to hear from and most want to know about are no longer certain certain investigative leads are just shut off for now um right. and the things right. that i'm those questions about i don't have any way of pursuing it i do think it's interesting that an account was a county sheriff's department file um for some strange reason the files of troy jones and jack badger including all of jack badger's trash which i still don't understand um was in the same file as a certain alternate suspect for no apparent reason hmm. and i do have a lot of questions about that but at this point, I just, people are dead. I have nowhere else to take it. All right. Well, if anyone can take it anywhere, Susan, it will be you. I'm, I'm or sure Or Jack Badger. It. You have my number now. Call me. <laughs> <laughs> Susan Simpson, it's been such a pleasure hosting the addendum this season. Thank you so much for asking me to do it. Rebecca, I'm so glad you were here to do it. It's a very interesting case, and we're not done with it yet. We will have more episodes in the future on Titus. I'm sure of it. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this edition of the Undisclosed Addendum. Do you have tips about any of the cases covered on the podcast? Questions about the cases? Email undisclosedpodcast at gmail.com or send your tips and questions on social media at undisclosedpod on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Audio production for the Addendum is by Hannah McCarthy. The executive producer of Undisclosed is Methel Telham. I'm Rebecca Lavoie. If you want to hear more of me, check out my true crime review podcast, Crime Writers On. For everyone on Undisclosed, thanks so much for listening. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>